All right, so welcome to today's webinar. We we're gonna watch the participant count climb and uh, welcome a few more people into the room. Uh, some quick reminders as people are coming in. Um, we will have the ability to ask Heidi some questions as we go through this. So there's a Q&A box that you can click on at the bottom of the screen. You can ask your question. If it's pertinent to where we are in the presentation, I'll just kind of say, Heidi, hang on, and I'll ask the question or I may save it till the end. We'll see how that goes. Uh, you can also chat in the box if you like. I've got both of those open and can, can kind of control those on my side and, and we'll um, you know, flow through this. Uh, this what I feel is um, a really, really important piece of what we're gonna be dealing with. And uh, my personal opinion is that, and we're already beginning to see some of these effects. I've been affected with this personally. Um, probably yesterday, I was telling Heidi before everybody gone, yesterday was one of the toughest days I had in a very long time. And uh, last night was really bad for me. And I think, you know, the next big health crisis in our country or in our world will be mental health because of, um, because of all this. And, you know, we're really kind of getting started um, through, through all of this. So the other side is going to be very interesting um, and very difficult. So um, I'm happy that Heidi's here to to answer some questions, to give us some insight and to help us with this. And she has a unique perspective that she wants to talk a little bit about because she's been recovering from COVID-19 for about four weeks now. So she's gonna weave that into her story. Maybe for some of you, it's one of the first people you've talked to that are affected by this. And um, so she, she will tie in her personal experience to the management of stress through that personal experience because if this is the first one, it won't be the last one. There will be plenty of people. Let me give you a little bit of Heidi's background. She is the Chief Energy Officer of Synergy Brain Fitness, a company providing brain-based health and performance programs to individuals and organizations. She's written seven books. Um, that's more books than anybody that we've done webinars with so far. Um, she recently created, I know you're going to talk about this as well, the Virtual First Responder Program in order uh, to provide and integrate brain health support and solutions to organizations during this outbreak. So that'll be interesting to see. So today we're going to talk through kind of five keys to building a solid foundation for energy and resilience. So you can help the most important people in your life and yourself through this crisis. So Heidi, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Andy. Well, we were just chatting for a moment before we got started that it's been way too long since Andy and I have seen each other or spent time together. And I will start by saying that's one of the blessings in all of this is I have actually reconnected with some of the most important people in my life, uh, the people who've had the greatest impact on me. And Andy has been one of those people in a short period of time. So it's really nice to be with you again. Um, and as he mentioned, I am actually just now starting to share a little bit more of my personal story. I'm always an open book, so that's not new. But uh, I was really resistant to even admitting to myself that I mo most likely had the COVID virus. And um, just to not spend too much time on this, but let you know a little bit about how that evolved. Um, I was traveling, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this. Um, I love what I do, so I want to push through. For me, working is not work. It's actually relaxing that's harder. Uh, which is actually what prompted me to write one of my books called Stressaholic was realizing that, hey, wait a second, I actually really like stress, stressing out more than I do chilling out. Um, I've never said that before, that was catchy. Anyway, so I, I was traveling and I was in Seattle working with Boeing and I was actually helping them with some stress mastery internally. We were doing a, a training program and um, there's some just odd circumstances around that time, but I typically, and I don't know if it's just self-defense, but kind of put my, you know, lens on going through airports and trying to not pick up all this stuff, whether it's actually contagious, like we would think like a virus or contagious like stress, which is incredibly con contagious, especially in airports. And uh, so I was just powering through and ended up getting a rental car, spending some time in Seattle, did notice a couple interactions that I had with people who may or may not have been sick. Um, and a couple of days later, I started not feeling well. I knew I was run down. And typically what happens for me when I travel and give a presentation, there's an intensity that comes with that of, you know, being on. And I've learned now having done this for about 20 years that the 
the waves of being a peak performer are really important to understand because there's an up and an intensity and anxiety, especially if it really matters to you, especially if you're highly sensitive, um, that you know makes us really good at what we do. We can connect with people better when we can bring that type of intensity and connection and commitment. But then afterwards, there's a a downside, you know, just like if you were to go to the gym and work out your body and then you need to take a recovery break, you can't be training your brain or your nervous system 24 seven, just like your muscles, it will start to atrophy. And I learned this, I could spend all hour, I'm not going to talking about how I've learned that in my own life, dealing with mental health since I was a child dealing with mental health situations and challenges. So I kept pushing through. So I went to Seattle, came back, got sick for a few days um, and really had a, a moment to kind of say, I'm going to take three days. <laughs> that makes me laugh as I'm saying it now, because I just started reflecting on all of this. This was around February 26th. I said, I have three days to be sick as if I put it in my calendar. So I'm going to stay home, be on the couch, watch reruns and just heal myself. And I know what to do. This is what I teach people. So I did the whole thing, soaked myself in all the immune boosting techniques and many of which I'm going to share with you guys today. And, uh, and then it was time to go back to work. So even though I wasn't feeling optimal, um, I had to drive to speak for a new client. I was really excited about since it was only a drive. I figured this will be perfect. I did not feel well. They had just started putting parameters around how many people could meet in the space, but was interesting about this. And I will say there's other emotional layers of some, what feels like guilt and shame that I pushed through and could have negatively impacted other people. Um, that you know, we went and I did the session. It was for International Women's Day. And so I was delighted to be there. But they had decided that groups of larger than, I don't know, 150 people couldn't gather. And we were right at about 150. And groups of 25 couldn't gather starting Monday. So I was like, oh, we just made it. So I'm sitting in the back. And mind you, I've got a, I've got a cough. I'm not really coughing much up. I couldn't taste food for a few days. All these weird things at the time. And um, kept pushing through, but I kept my distance from people, washing my hands, all of that. And um, that night, interestingly, I had been asked to do a webinar for entrepreneurs organization for their chapters in Asia. And again, I was so honored to be able to serve that community, which I've really just fallen in love with over the years. And um, so late at night, and I'm doing this talk for them about how to manage the stress of uncertainty and chaos in these difficult times. And that was, you know, these people in other countries far over there. And it was just ironic that I happened to be struggling. And it's strange now to watch that webinar back and know how much I was actually physically really suffering. So long story short or shorter, um, also had to travel to LA and eventually San Francisco and just again thought this is so ironic that all of this is happening and I'm now into my fifth week of trying to recover um, and certainly happy to share more about what those experiences have been like. I'm going to wait till the end so we can get into the content but I think there's a couple of really important lessons in all of this. Um, the first one is and I've, I've always said this our body is business relevant our brain is business relevant. And I don't think it's ever been more obvious than it is right now. So no matter how much we try to think our way out of a stressful situation or think ourselves into feeling well or pushing through going for a run, which I did, by the way, before I should have and probably set myself back because I have that same mentality of like, get in the game, the game is here. And I feel like I've been training my whole life for this game. And I'm so excited, you know, to like, I get to play pro now. All these people really need me. And then there's that other side of like, okay, I got in the game and I got hurt. And so what do I do now? Am I going to carry this injury with me throughout my entire career and be a so-so performer? Or am I going to do what I have to do? It makes me so emotional to think about it now. Am I willing to step out of the game for a minute and do what I really need to do? to be well and to feel well. And even thinking as we take this beyond COVID that we are contagious all the time, not just with a virus. In fact, our emotional energy is more contagious than anything else. We pick it up within a fifth of a second before the logical part of our brain can actually process it within about a half of a second. 
So I think it's so important in this moment to take these lessons and to start thinking, how do we use these moving forward as if it were a training opportunity? So let's get out of the game for a minute and let's start training ourselves so that when we're called into service again, we can be even more effective. And I'll also say that that mindset even now with the uncertainty and everything that's going on, the mindset of being curious. Can I be curious about my experience? I just wrote an article for LinkedIn and I talked about my life as an experiment because that has been a saving grace for me is to be able to step back in any moment. I could be angry, frustrated, irritable, sad, anxious, if I didn't say that one, anything. Um, even in the midst of a traumatic experience and take a step back, take a breath, and then say, what is happening? What is possibly in this for me? It doesn't mean when trauma is happening that we you know, say hallelujah and be super grateful in the moment. We don't have to kid ourselves, but what we can do is say, what could I be grateful for right now? And is there a possibility of a life lesson happening here that will make me stronger as a result? And our research right now with the brain health initiative that I'm working on with colleagues from Harvard and, and Mass General Hospital, that's what we're doing now with the COVID-19 in particular is we're starting to look at how people are using this experience to reframe their mindset and how that may actually keep them healthier as a result. So I'm about to, to go to my slides here. As I'm doing that, Andy, um, just wanna check in with you. I see you nodding a lot. Is anything landing for you right now that you wanna share? Yeah, I think um, you know a lot of what you're saying about is, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to do is to stop in that moment and say, what is it, what am I grateful for? You know, when the shit's hitting the fan, it's just a constant barrage. Um, in addition to that, you know, I, I, I do talk to myself about this is a, a learning lesson. I know on the other side of this, I'll be more resilient. I'll be stronger. I'll be smarter. I'll be better. And I'll be able to handle a lot more things in the future. It's just the fight on a day-to-day -day basis to get through it. Um, that is, is just such a heavy, heavy challenge. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not dealing with COVID-19 personally, you know, going through all of it either. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm dealing with working with companies on layoffs and restructures and, you know, all the, you know, kind of wildness that comes along. And, you know, even last night I had a, you know, a late night call from somebody who was like, you know, a little bit suicidal and through all this. So, you know, I was attempting to get that person help. So yeah. it's just a, it's just heavy, heavy, it's heavy. So, yeah. So I'm looking forward Very to heavy. me personally, if nobody else was on this call, <laughs> um, I'd be totally cool with it because this is what I need to hear right now. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. This is heavy. And I want to make sure everyone understands that, that when we think about changing our mindset and thinking in a new way to optimize our experiences, I am in no way minimizing someone's experience. And in fact, maybe now finally admitting to myself and others that I am sick makes it easier to do that because I'm having the experience too. And I had a meltdown. I've had a lot. Uh, yesterday was also my hardest day. And I'll tell you all that specifically what happened for me was I'm in a high rise building in San Diego. We're actually getting ready to move to the beach specifically because I need to be in a more calm environment. Um, I've had a lot of different factors throughout my life that have caused some trauma. One of which just recently we've had several earthquakes. And so when that happens, uh, I was also on a plane on 9-11, just had a lot of things. Every time you have a trauma, capital T, big stuff or little t, disappointments, um, not getting along with your spouse, um, losing a, an employee, I mean, all sorts of things. Those little T traumas are like micro injuries to the brain and the nervous system. And if we don't heal, then we layer them on top of each other. And so now what happens is one little thing or, or something that should have been little activates the whole system and we can shut down. So extreme, in fact, that I have a condition called, makes me giggle, not because it's funny, but um, you'll know why in a second. I have a condition called vasovagal syndrome. And what that means is I will actually lose consciousness if I get overstimulated. And it's happened since I was 12 years old. It took a long time to figure out what it was. But I giggle a little because typically when I tell people that, they start sending me videos of fainting goats and then say, oh, is this what you have? So not the same, but kind of the same, which is we actually have this primitive nervous system um, 
And without going into all the details, these are the types of things they teach people in our stress mastery educator program or our coaching program is exactly what does stress do to the brain and the body so that we know how to navigate through those experiences. It's not to manage stress or push it away. In fact, I don't even like the term stress management. I like stress mastery because stress mastery is using the fuel of stress for what it's intended to do, which is help us to overcome the gap between demand and capacity and then be able to problem solve more effectively. But if we stay trapped in that chronic activated stress state, that's where we run into trouble. So I am going to share a little bit with you guys about what that looks like. Um, I do want to set a little bit of framework just for what we're going to do. And we're not going to get into tons of depth in all of this because I'm also very mindful of time. Um, but I just want to touch on this no do gap because we all know what we should be doing. It doesn't mean we do it. Um, I want to talk about my three-step process for mastering stress, which is to assess it, appreciate it, and adjust it. And then I want to help you create your own recharge toolkit. I'm going to give you um, some examples of things I use. I'm going to give you some resources, free resources you can use online, and um, I'll, I'll continue to support you guys the best I can with that. Um, I also realized I didn't finish my story about yesterday, and I'll just say that there was um, some activation. There were some people I don't know if it's rioting's the right word, but living downtown, there's people driving in circles downtown, honking their horns. And apparently they were angry about something happening with the immigrant population. And while I appreciate that and want to allow them to have their voice and of all people, my heart, you know, is, is quick to go out and try to help. Um, when you've dealt with trauma and now you're in a pretty traumatic situation being stuck at home and being sick and people are honking their horns for 30 minutes driving around your condo, it's incredibly activating. So that was my meltdown moment and it turned into just blubbering, sobbing, shaking. Um, and, and the good thing is I know what to do when it happens. I've practiced this proactively so much. I practice every day how to recharge my brain and get it back online that in the moment when something happens and we get hijacked, I know the steps. I don't have to go through a formula and figure it out. I go straight to my recharge practice, which for me had to do with breathing essential oils, listening to the sound of the ocean waves crashing, closing my eyes and visualizing I was at the beach, even having a fan blowing cool air on me. I do this whole beach brain like bliss thing every single morning and every night before I go to bed. And it sounds crazy, but I could be talking to you right now, Andy, and actually be at the beach in my brain. <laughs> and you're moving there. So that's, uh, and I'm moving there to just get the whole experience. So, so I'll teach you guys a little bit more about that. I do want to say that we are in a stressful situation. Life is stressful. We had a stress mess before COVID-19. And in fact, this is what I taught about before all of this happened. And just a couple of little things to keep in mind are that 75 to 90% of medical visits are considered to be stress related. Anxiety is now the most common mental health problem. And most of that is unfortunately happening within our schools. So we know that it's extremely high in college students. Suicide is the number two leading cause of death in uh, college students. I actually have a brand new program that we are launching called Brain Boss for college students to use these integrative neuroscience concepts to learn how to train their own brain and master stress. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna teach college students to be mentors and then take this out to the high schools in their areas. Um, and we're gonna get some business people involved with that as well to serve as ambassadors. So as I, as that unfolds, that actually was supposed to roll out in April. It's now getting bumped to May because of the um, virtual first responder program, which essentially we're gonna be training people up to be able to go do this work faster. We just realized we needed to slow our role with our new normal and uh, figure out how to do this more sustainably. Good news is we're also getting some grant funding and some great support that will help us to do that um, instead of you know me and my mom and dad and husband trying to, you know, what, you know, those teams, like it's one person and three quarters of a person in their spare time trying to pull all this off. So now we're, we're going to get serious about it. Um, and then depression is actually the leading cause of disability in the workplace. I think that surprises a lot of people because we don't talk about it enough. And I do these programs for 
corporations all the time. And we don't call it stress management and we don't call it mental health training or social, emotional, mental, whatever. I love those concepts, but employees don't want to talk about that. And they feel like if they come to that session, then they're showing a weakness. Yeah. We, we do corporate wellness wrong, I think, and I'll, then I'll get off my soapbox on this because we put in a gym or a cafe or give a meditation class and think that we're going to change a culture. And we are way off because the employees just feel like if they do that, again, it's either a weakness or they're being lazy. It's not embedded into the culture. And in fact, we could do meetings more mindfully, like get the team together and before your meeting, do a gratitude practice or watch a funny video. There's so many ways to actually embed mental and emotional health into what we're already doing. Um, I always think it's like a sneak approach to making people healthy. Um, so anyway, we, we probably could do a whole discussion on that later, Andy, yeah. about best practices for engaging like employees into these types of initiatives. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And you know, what's interesting too is, um, when this all kind of started a couple of weeks ago and spun up really fast, um, I've had a mindfulness coach for a couple of years now. And we asked her if she would do mindfulness sessions, 15 minute segments and offer it to the companies and the employees of the companies that we work with. Yeah. She started out doing four sessions a day. She was you know, doing from like 7 a.m. And she'd do the last one around 7.30 p.m. as a, as a you know, personal favor. Mm -hmm. Pushed it out to all the companies. Um, and nobody showed up. And even even like to, to just today, we limited it to, to just one session a day yeah. just to get people to show up. And yeah. even with me, like, hey, you got to do this. Hey, it's really important. Hey, it's only 15 minutes. Um, people still don't take advantage of it. And there's two things there, really. Number one is you all know if you're here and you're a leader, they're watching you. Are you going to those classes? Because if you're not going to those classes, they're looking at you and saying they want to be you someday. Well, you're modeling to them that, well, when you're me, you're too busy, you're too stressed, all of that kind of stuff. And we have been modeling leadership so ineffectively for so long. So I think that has to change. It's why I actually only work with organizations who are willing to embed this into leadership first, because otherwise it's a waste of your time, a waste of my time, a waste of our money. Um, that said, again, if you think strategically, there's a lot of ways you can build this into the culture. So it doesn't have to be a wellness initiative. It's a culture shift that is now using these really simple shifts that I call neural nudges. Like you can nudge people's neurons their, in their brain and their whole nervous system to show up in a more relaxed, more flexible, more creative, innovative, collaborative way. Those are all the things that we say we want, but we have to embed it. Um, anyway, so we'll, we'll have more to talk about that. I wanna to get to you guys. I wanna think about putting our own hat on first and what we need to do. And just again, emphasize that what I'm gonna teach you about is not new. Um, everyone knows what they should be doing to take better care of themselves. The challenge is we don't prioritize it. Um, we let other things get in the way. And a lot of it is this really stress situation and how we get hijacked by that. So I'll have you just think for a moment about stress as being a relationship that you have with the circumstances of your life. So if, if I was an alien and I came down to this planet and were to ask you, what is the stress thing that you all keep talking about? Everyone would define it differently. And most people would actually come up with things that are thoughts or feelings or experiences. So here's some of the common answers. If I ask people, how do you define stress? They'll say things like anxiety, worry, or tension. They may say threat. They may say people. I get that answer a lot. Um, oftentimes I hear too much to do, not enough time. And I will say that I have done a survey of over 38,000 people at this point, looking at what lifestyle factors contribute most to stress. So looking at nutrition, fitness, commute time, sleep time, travel, jet lag, all sorts of things. And the number one is the feeling that there's not enough time to get it all done. And if you think about it, we, we go to bed worried because we have so much to do tomorrow and we're not gonna have enough time. So our brain can't really rest. And then we wake up in the morning and what's the first thing we do for most of us? 
we grab our phone or we watch the news or we read the paper. We do something in this activated state that just said, yeah, now we really don't have enough to do. So we're constantly triggering our brain to say, you need to be stressed and you're gonna need to stay there for a while. So what stress actually is, is what happens in the gap between demand and capacity. Okay, so we have a certain capacity and energy bucket. And with more time, I would go through the five different energy buckets that I usually teach about, which are physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and social. Now, I will say with our virtual first responder program, we are looking at the buckets a little differently. We've had financial. Um, not that we didn't think it was important before, but typically I talk about the human system and those five factors. With the organizational approach, which is really what the, the virtual first responder program is all about, is helping organizations and leaders, because we know that we need to all be able to reach people, to reach as many people as we need right now, um, is that financial is an important thing to be paying attention to. And the other one is operational. So Andy, the types of things you were saying, like how do I help people manage their business right now? What are the logistics? What are the, the practices and tactics? And we're looking at you know, leadership strategies and all sorts of things within that kind of operational bucket. So if you look at all seven of those and say, I have a certain capacity and now there's a demand at any moment, that's constantly gonna be fluctuating. That's the way the human system works. So we're supposed to be oscillating ups and downs from heartbeats and blood sugar to your brain waves and day and night. And I'm just kind of, I'm noticing there's a couple people out socializing outside, which is nice. It's sunny and I'm happy to see that. Um, but we're always gonna have that fluctuation. The worst thing that ever happens is when we flatline. And so if you think about how most of us spend our day, we get up in the morning and we go and go and go and go and go and go and go, and go until we can't go anymore. And then we're surprised that we can't fall asleep at night. And so the healthy oscillation that's supposed to look like a curve or waves has flatlined. And unfortunately, not making light of this, but it may make you giggle a little bit when you realize how true it is. The only oscillation most people have is caffeine and sugar to get up in the morning and stress because that'll get you amped up too. And alcohol and sleeping pills to go to bed at night. And that is so consistent right now. It goes back to my first point that this is not a COVID problem. This is a us problem. This is an everyday problem. This is something we need to master now. And we're in a moment in time right now to pay more attention to it because we've got more people asking for it and showing up to the webinars that we have about it. So what you see in that image, stress is initiated as soon as demand exceeds capacity. And in that moment, it's helpful. And I'm gonna show you exactly how in a moment. When it becomes harmful and toxic is when the stress load gets to be too much. So either demand continues without rebuilding capacity or capacity diminishes more over time. I'm gonna make a couple more quick comments here and then I'll pause Andy to see if you wanna chime in here. I want, I want everyone to think about what we've been taught as the stress response really as being the stress reactions because a response is what happens when we use our whole brain. And that's what I'm gonna teach you about in this next part. How do we then master stress? How do we bring our whole brain online so that we can make responses instead of having to just follow our reactions? And so much of this is dependent on the type of stress I love to think about this as if you were exercising in the gym. So when we exercise, we break down our muscles or we um, strain our cardiovascular system just enough for just the right amount of time so that it can kind of break down, recover, and build up stronger as a result. So essentially that's what happens. Really, if we were to go into depth here, I would say your relationship with stress is based on the type frequency, duration, and intensity of those experiences and of the gaps that are showing up. Again, just like working out at the gym. The other piece though that really impacts this, and this is where I spend the most time in my own research, is the lens through which you see those situations. So here you'll see two primary types of stress. Type number one would be acute. That's when something is truly an emergency in the moment. And when I say in the moment, you need to be able to take action within about 30 minutes and have this resolved. 
That's how fast acting the chemicals like adrenaline are in our system. So the construction noise I'm hearing right now, if that was actually like, I don't know, a battalion coming up here, like something I actually had to run away from, then I'd be grateful that I was getting that sound cue and I would take action and I would mobilize the adrenaline in my body, it would not be toxic for me. It would actually increase my heart rate, increase my blood pressure, improve my immune function, improve my memory, focus, attention, and I'd be sensitive to what's going on around me. If you've ever had a traumatic experience, you know these things happen. And if we mobilize it, then it helps us. It's why stressing is a blessing when we actually need to use it or we learn how to use it better. Type two is chronic. It's what it's the everyday, not enough kind of situation, you know, too much to do, not enough time, or feeling like we're not adequate as who we are, not practicing things like self-compassion and kindness and patience and love, not only for other people, but for ourselves. We can get hijacked into the chronic state. And this is where cortisol takes over um, all the things you see here on the screen. That's where our memory goes down, immune function goes down. It's essentially like you're going to war, but you run out of resources. And so now there's a rebound effect and now you've weakened your defenses, you've weakened your resilience and your adaptability. And this is where adaptability, which is supposed to help us, starts to hurt us. This is the work on my dissertation right now um, on human adaptability. And I've come up with an adaptability quotient that I'm starting to teach organizations to understand really what adaptability is when we say, we want people to be adaptable. We aren't really telling the whole truth. We want them to adapt in the way we want them to. But I'll tell you what, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, suicidal ideation, those are all adaptable. You would never want someone to adapt in that way. So we call it maladaptive, but it's still adaptive. What's the word or what's the, the framework that we would use if we wanted someone to adapt to be stronger, it's what I call pro-adaptability, it's positive adaptability. And it's so important because in this moment in time, with the right resources and the right strategy, we can pro-adapt to positive and be stronger as a result. So that's a lot of content before we start getting into the actual tools. Andy, let me pause for a second and see any questions or any uh, anything you wanna kinda reinforce no questions have come in yet. Again, you can just post a question if you have a question for Heidi in the Q&A and I'll read that to her at these little mini breaks and then we'll cover a few at the end as well. Um, I was interested in that pro-adaptability kind of comments you made at the end and um, how, long, how long does that take? What are a couple things that somebody could do or as a leader we could do with our teams and you know, is it a, is it a long runway to have adaptability in that regard? Is there something we can do that's short? You know, time is yeah. really short these days. Yeah, you know, I think it's 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 really the stress mastery model that I'm going to share with you guys now is what can help us to become more adaptable. The difference in the adaptability quotient is the words that we use to describe some of these. So, for example, um, there's a model, and again, we can come back and talk about this another time. But if you were to picture four quadrants, when we think about stress or even energy, we know that there's high and low kind of energy. Um, you could also think about this as sympathetic, which is activated nervous system and parasympathetic, which is more the rest and digest side of that. So uh, just for simple terms, high, high energy, low energy, and then we have the positive to negative, right? So if we were to look at a high energy negative, that would be something like anxiety. If we were to look at a low energy negative, um, that would be depression. Um, what's interesting though to me is that we talk about the term resilience as if that's something we want and, and I'm just part of what I'm trying to emphasize is, is resilience is good when that's all that's possible. We want to bounce back, but resilience is just bouncing back to where we were before. So if I get sick and I'm resilient, then I'm going to be the same person I was when I'm done with all of this and that's just not good enough for me. <laughs> Makes me emotional to think about that. I want to be better than I was before. And so I think for organizations who are saying, well, we want you to come talk about resilience. It's almost like nails on a chalkboard to me once you have that aha moment. I'm like, no, you don't. I'll talk about it. But by the end of it, I don't want to use that word anymore because what you really want is, yes, we want to come back to where we were, but why wouldn't we want to be better? And that's the piece that really, it takes enough timing to be able to sit back and actually follow. Let me show you this. I'm going to jump to this slide. And to follow the stress mastery formula, 
which is so simple, by the way, it can be done in an instant, which is to assess what's really going on, to appreciate something about it, and then to address it. And the reason this is so different is that most of us want to assess it and adjust it. Or we want to, you know, what's going on and how do I fix it? How do I problem solve? And here's the problem is when it comes to the human system, every change is perceived as a threat. So if you're in a threatening situation and then you say, I need to fix this, you've just activated more of your threat system. So yesterday, as that was happening and I was having my little meltdown, what gets me stuck and gets other people stuck is that feeling of being out of control. And it's when my body starts to shake and it's just like, I can't live like this anymore. I mean, this is where people become suicidal and I hate to take us that deep right now, but I think it's important for people to understand because I have struggled with suicidal ideation my whole life because in those moments when I'm not the boss of my own brain because something else is going on, I am not me. And, and thank God I have an amazing husband who will sit next to me or leave me alone, depending on what I need. Usually it's like rapidly cycling. I need you here now. I don't now come back, that kind of stuff. Um, we also use a lot of humor, obviously. And that's actually another circuit breaking technique for stress that I teach in all of my sessions. So the difference is when that's happening and I go, oh my gosh, those people need to stop driving around their cars and making all that noise. I hate living in this condo. This is why I want to move. I need to move now. And I'm sick. Oh my gosh. Right? Like we just can't even breathe. Or we're able to take a step back and there's a moment where we can come to our senses. That's the cues I'm gonna teach you about in the recharge techniques. For me, it's essential oils is a big one of those. So the first thing I do is I grab an essential oil blend that I really like and I have several of them. But it just, the essential oil, when you smell something, it goes directly to the emotional center in the brain. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to judge it. You don't have to try to reshape your experiences. All you do is smell. And that smell will go straight through the olfactory center of the brain and start to nudge it into a healthier direction. And then you can do something different. Breathing would be the same if you get a nice rhythmic breathing pattern. But my point here is, once you do that and you just come to your senses for a moment and allow yourself to lean into this stress mastery formula, you assess what's really going on. So for me, I needed to find out right away what was happening. And, and fortunately, I have contacts in the media. So I texted my friend who's a producer and said, what is going on downtown? Okay, then I went into kind of figuring out what I needed to do with my body. But I got the answers. If I couldn't have gotten the answers, I still would have just done the settling down part. But for me, knowing someone was gonna try to get some information for me was helpful because of the 9-11 and earthquakes and all that. It was like, okay, they're, they're rioting about something. They're not bombing my building and you know, I'm safe. That's, I need to know I'm safe. We all need to know we're safe first. But then I assess what's going on. You know, What am I really feeling right now? And I'm obviously, feeling traumatized. In this case, this is an extreme jump, but I'll show you how to do this with a less extreme. I'm feeling traumatized right now. I appreciate, and I do genuinely appreciate, my own experiences that have gotten me to this point. I can be kind to myself. I've been through a lot. We've all been through a lot, no matter what your story is. To be human is to suffer. If I can appreciate my own humanity, and suffering and be kinder to myself, or if I can appreciate the fact that my husband's trying to help or appreciate that I have a roof over my head, whatever, it doesn't have to be major. But what happens in the appreciation step is you shift your neurochemistry out of that threat, stress, crisis state into something we call vagal tone or the vagus nerve or the parasympathetic. So you can't appreciate and freak out at the same time. You can't. Now you could rapidly cycle, which is where the practice comes in. But the more you do this, the easier you can get there. So now if I've assessed the situation and said, I'm experiencing trauma, this doesn't really have to do with the people honking their horns. This is activating something in me. I'm feeling traumatized. I need to feel safe. I appreciate why I'm feeling the way that I am and what I have in this moment to be grateful for. And then I make the adjustment. Now what's happened is I have aligned my brain from the bottom to the top. I'm looking to see if I have the image. I don't, uh, actually here, let me, let me show you guys this real quick. 
the brain is organized in a specific hierarchy from the bottom to the top. So we have what's often called the lizard brain at the base of the brain where you see here on the slide in green. Then we have what sometimes is called the monkey mind or the monkey brain in the middle, which is my favorite because I love monkeys. Um, and then the top part, which is the human part of the brain. And interestingly enough, we see that these are aligned with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Doesn't make sense. We have those fundamental physiological needs that we must have before the rest of our brain lights up. So if you were to imagine like fuel or electricity, which is how our brain is fueled through electricity and, and chemistry, imagine that was lighting up from the bottom to the top. So when we're hijacked, it's stuck at the bottom. We're so primitive, we're childlike. I mean, when I get those like shaking fits or even faint, I'm like a five-year-old who's experiencing trauma. I can't think and problem solve. I can do it quicker because I've practiced this so much. But if we recognize that that's where we're at and recognize what do I really need in this moment and we use those recharge techniques, then you can move up to appreciation, acceptance of what's happening and then you can problem solve and there you can help other people as well. So these, that these brain techniques. hierarchy is so important to know. Yeah, and, and this visual helps uh, helps me kind of grasp the grasp this. In I need to break, I need to create the break from the bottom of the hierarchy to be able to elevate to the top. Yeah, it's the best way I can think about it, and I've been using this term a lot, is circuit breaking stress. So just know that when we're activated like that, we're talking super primitive part of the brain. We become emotionally more irritable, frustrated, aggressive. Um, I do not like the person that I am with my amazingly lo loving husband when I'm in this, but all I'm thinking at this moment is I just need to be safe and I need you as my husband to do everything it takes to make me safe. And fortunately he's willing to do that. But as leaders, it's the same thing. Our employees need us first and foremost to help them feel safe. And sometimes we don't have all the answers. So we think that we either need to not communicate with them at all because we don't want to freak them out or we over communicate and give them too much information. You know, so much of this is about what is the environment need to feel safer right now. And there's a lot of, again, circuit breaking techniques that we can go into another time. I wanna go back to focus on you, yourself, your vehicle. How do you put your oxygen mask on first? We've so got a few questions. Yeah, questions. please, please go ahead. Um, uh, suggestions for leaders to use with staff re working remotely can be done from a distance, obviously, to create yeah. the feeling of connect connection and um, while being distanced. Yeah, so I think these are gonna be similar things to what I would suggest as well if we were doing a meeting, the difference is we're now doing so remote. So thank goodness we do have these platforms like Zoom and others, um, many of which are coming on board now. I just found out LinkedIn is gonna have LinkedIn Live uh, I think they've been doing it a little bit, but they're going to be doing more and more. I'm excited about that. So there's a lot of good platforms. I would suggest first and foremost to minimize how much different variety you're giving people right now. So like pick a platform, they all work well, find your favorite, and then don't be looking at five of the newest, latest, greatest. Um, so that's important. We need to minimize the overload that will help them feel more safe. And then, you know, when you're running your meetings, give some time for people to share what they feel grateful for. And by the way, I'm always like really watching time. Um, I think one of the ways we make people feel safe is keeping things on time. And so I found that doing virtual meetings or teaching class, I teach a Harvard class virtually. And we also were supposed to be meeting on campus in May and obviously that won't be happening. Um, and I've noticed that now that we're doing more of this with our other programs and um, with companies, we, we need to set really good boundaries and guidelines of how people participate. Everyone should be on camera all the time as if they were in a meeting. Unless they're sick or something's going on, there's truly an emergency that does happen for people sometimes and that's fine, but they should let everyone in the group know why they're not on camera. Speaking to a faceless screen is more stressful than speaking to a screen that shows people sleeping or angry or crying because you have no cues. Um, in fact, I'd say for a fun test, have your employees give a presentation 
to 20 people without their cameras on. It is really stressful. And Andy, I see you giggling because you probably had this happen. Um, so we, we need that. So now, yes, there's a lot of faces on the screen and we can control that. People also need to be able to speak. And so we need to realize that when we're meeting virtually, we cannot get as much content across as we could in person. And people are doing the opposite. They're trying to cram more information and we're operating at this fast pace. But the thing is, we don't have nonverbals. So even right now, I'm stopping from time to time. I would love to power through and make sure I get through everything, but I'm stopping from time to time to check in with Andy also so that all of us get a chance to catch our breath. Because if you're sitting here having information thrown at you and you don't have a moment to ask a question or make a contribution, it actually is stressful to your nervous system, especially with employees who have to be here. Like you all chose to be here, so I don't feel as bad for you, but people who are forced to be in a meeting and not allowed to speak their truth or voice their concerns or whatever, doesn't mean you have to address all of them. It's what's so great about these platforms. And then I'm gonna continue so that I can get to the rest of these tools. But you know, if you're leading a meeting like this, normally I'm um, keeping an eye on the chat and using Q&A. So what I would typically do if I didn't have Andy here with me is I would show some slides. I would have people, I would ask questions and have people discussing off and on on chat with each other. By the way, I would block private chat from people because it's just too tempting for them to start talking about something unrelated. So keep people focused, block private chat, allow them to chat with the group. I would ask a question in the beginning. I would say, how do you guys define stress? What do you notice happening in your body when you're feeling stressed out? And I'd give them some time to reflect on that, see each other's. Then I would keep an eye on Q&A and I'd let everyone know ahead of time. We're gonna chat in chat. I'm gonna download it, look at it later in case there's any questions I don't cover. But I'm gonna keep an eye on the Q&A box because there I can really make sure that I'm moderating it in the right pace as we go along. Those types of like setting boundaries for people, letting people know, hey, I've got your back. I'm watching the clock. We are not gonna go a minute past the hour. In fact, I always try to end 10 minutes early. I'll tell you right now, it's not happening in this session, but most of the time I try to end 10 minutes early because it also forces me as a leader and a teacher to consolidate my information to the most important points. People can't absorb as much when they're virtual versus in person. And we have to keep in mind all the distractions people are dealing with. Um, I could go on and on about this. I actually am, am teaching a four, no, I'm sorry, two and a half day program virtually. And in the past, I would have just dreaded that. But I, I'm so ready for this because there's so many, and Zoom has been the one I've used the most. There's so many interactive features. You can put people in breakout groups, which are really great, allow them to discuss and then come back and have one person share key ideas. You can give them time off the screen, which is so important. So now here's something I want you to read, or even I want you to watch this video or this movie, or I want you to have this discussion with your family tonight and come back tomorrow and share some ideas. Give people time away from the screen because we're looking at screens too much too. Okay, I'm gonna keep going and get to just some practical takeaway stuff and then I'll answer any other questions you have. Um, what I like to take people through in understanding their relationship with stress is what I call a stress 360. So it's the stress load, which is what we talked about. And I have handouts. In fact, I'll make sure you guys have access to the stress load survey because it's really easy. Um, it looks at your demand versus capacity. It's something you could use with your employees and just walk through it with them. Be a good gauge of how they're doing. And I will tell you that the stress mastery coaches that I have trained will tell me that this tool is really helpful for them because it allows people to see where they have personal ownership and responsibility of this dynamic. Because most people are gonna say their stress comes from everything happening out there and they'll wanna blame you all as leaders all the time, trust me, because they tell me about it. And they'll usually say, well, you know, this is helpful, but you know who really needs to be here is my boss, Andy. And my favorite thing, because this is how I do programs now, is to be able to say, Andy was in the session. In fact, that's why we're doing it for you all right now, because we've already done this with the senior leadership team. They're so on board. So here's what we're going to do differently. They love that. In the past, I would go do them without that. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It sucks. And that's not the answer. I don't like doing that. It stresses me out. 
So stress load is something you can do right now. You don't have to be trained on it. It's really easy. Stress lens is really looking at perspective, mindset, non-conscious bias. There's a little bit more that goes into that, but I actually have a free assessment with my partners at a company called Total Brain. Um, the person who actually started that company, Dr. Evian Gordon, is my research partner, one of my best friends now. We're doing a lot of research together and we're working together on some programming where we can have employees use his um, brain fitness assessment and online training platforms and then add some live content like what we're doing right now. Um, but they love that because they actually get to get their negativity bias scores. I just don't like people to take that honestly without having the conversation first. Um, so as a resource, I will follow up and, and share these things with Andy and Leah so they can share them with you, but just keep that in mind. When people take an assessment and they don't know why they're taking it and they don't really understand it, I've found that it does more harm than good. In fact, Andy, you've done this assessment. You did the earlier version of the brain fitness assessment. We, I've had 300 um, successful entrepreneurs take it. I got great data. I was able to talk about the entrepreneurial mindset, what works, what doesn't. But the challenge we ran into a lot was people were kind of forced to take it as part of a training program. The platform wasn't working near as well. Now it's just been seamless. You can use it on your phone, your computer. Um, but I find it, there's a conversation that has to happen around that so that people can connect those dots and, and get the most return on their investment, especially if you're asking them to do more assessments. And then the last thing is your stress signature, which is essentially just the signs and symptoms that show up when you experience stress. Um, so we'll follow up with those resources. Let me get to what I call the fab five of our stress solutions. This is the part where you're gonna say, yeah, no duh, I already knew that, but let me give you some highlights. The fab five that I've been teaching since the time I started teaching 20 years ago um, is to eat, move, sleep, rest, and connect. This is basic self-care stuff. Um, when we eat, not just think about what we eat, but think about when we're eating, the timing of that, and I would say most importantly, how. So an anti-inflammatory diet is definitely the best. We're learning more and more about different people who may prefer different dietary patterns. I definitely don't have time to go into all of that, although I do sessions on it, so that's an option. Um, but really the most important thing is, are we eating mindfully? Are we breathing? Are we eating where we're sitting down and relaxing? Are we at our desk? Most of our employees are eating at their desk while they're working or in their car and they're stressed out. So they're not digesting food well. They can eat the perfect food if they're stressed out, it's not working well in their body. It's not nourishing them. They're not even absorbing the nutrients that they should be. So we don't want to be stressed when we eat. Movement, super important. And uh, you don't have to go to the gym and put on spandex to get movement. This is just standing, stretching. I saw you standing for a while, Andy. I, I did buy a standing desk. Uh, because I had to move this morning last minute. I don't have it here, but it's gonna be the first thing I go home for because uh, that's just been a game changer for me. Being able to stand, move, same with meetings, you know, have people, there's a, it's gonna sound really silly, but I would really recommend for meetings, you guys check out a um, Go Noodle is what it's called, like G-O and then Noodle, and I'm still stuffed up, but it is hysterical, it's for kids, but it gets them moving and it shows these videos and I did it with my Pepperdine class the other day and our professor who's a judge, it's our law class, there's this one and there's these bubbles floating around and you're supposed to pop the bubbles and so it has you like dancing and popping bubbles and Judge T was um, you know, up there doing it and all the students were laughing and, and I'm sitting there you know, on my side of things saying, we should be doing this at least every, at least every 25 minutes, just Break it up to watch a funny video, listen to some music, get your body moving, oscillate. We've got to do that, especially the more we're looking at screens. So ideally moving at least every hour for at least five to 10 minutes. The more we're looking at screens, the more we need to move, the more we need fresh air, natural light as much as we can. Everyone knows we need to sleep. 
uh, more than we are. And the recommendation is seven to eight hours. I have an amazing sleep expert. I'm just gonna tell you all this right now because I know we're not gonna get through all the details. I am hosting a global stress summit that is 100% free. Um, it's gonna be on April 18th. Originally, we were doing it and trying to raise money and do all of this stuff for uh, scholarships and nonprofits and all of that. We still are doing that, but instead of having people pay, we're just working with some sponsors who can help us with this virtual first responder. We're gonna, on April 18th, have four or five live sessions. The rest is gonna be pre-recorded. You're gonna be able to access it whenever you want. One of those is my friend, Dr. Michael Bruce, who is the sleep doctor. He is fabulous and funny and full of practical tips. So rather than me even try to tell you, I just wanna encourage you guys, you can go to globalstresssummit.com. Um, it's that easy and sign up. Just know all of our experts actually aren't listed there yet because we're working so quickly to add more now that we're not um, constrained to just the hours we had in one day, which is what we were doing before. So rest is not sleep. Rest is what you need to do during the day. It's taking breaks. It's unplugging strategically. And just like movement, I would say your brain needs a break at least every hour, five to 10 minutes of doing something. So you can do both at the same time. You can get up, you can move, you can walk around, you can have a healthy snack, get some fresh air, and you have just recharged your own battery. You don't have to do one at a time. But this just going and doing something creative or reflective, um, tinkering with something is so, so important. And then the last one, of course, is connection. And just because we are social distancing, we're trying to change that term to physical distancing. We don't have to be socially distanced. In fact, we are desperate for social connection. We are hardwired to crave it. Studies have shown that feeling isolated is worse for your health than smoking cigarettes. And then I usually giggle and say, which doesn't mean go smoke with your friends, but you couldn't do that now anyway. Um, but the point being that we, we need human connection, like we need food, like we need water, like we need sleep. It is so, so critical. So it's not about volume, just like you wouldn't want to eat too much food or work out nonstop. It's about the right connection at the right time with the depth that we need. And I will say again, just like I started, that we have an opportunity to be more connected on purpose than ever before when we really align ourselves with people um, and causes that we care about and, and really use technology to our benefit. And I'm just going to end on this last note, Andy. Keep in mind, everyone, that common sense is not common practice. If I know anything for sure in myself, in others, we have to practice these things. And my favorite example is one that comes from San Diego. This is actually a colleague of mine. It turns out there's a gym here in Point Loma where people pay a lot of money to use exercise equipment, but then take the escalator to get there. And my colleague and I actually watched for a good 30 minutes, busy time of day, and not a single person took the stairs. And I just remember thinking, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, maybe they needed the escalator. No, these were very fit people paying money to get on a stair climber. So my point is that the brain perceives challenge as threat until we teach it other, a different way of looking at it, right? So at airports, when we see the stairs and we have just a backpack, or a light carry-on bag? Do we make the choice to take the stairs because we know we'll fear, feel better as a result? Even though everyone else looks at us like we're crazy, Andy, I bet you do that more than most is, is finding those opportunities to move and knowing that they're gonna benefit us in the long run, but we have to teach ourselves to do these things they are not natural. Yeah, our, our gym has an elevator and I see there's a back stair like the, you know, the hidden staircase. And I see people take that, that, that uh, elevator all the time. I'm like, there's, there's yeah. stuff right here. I don't, I don't, it's a strange. It's like fighting for the closest parking spot. It's so silly. Let me end with, okay, two things. Um, because I know we're about to run out of time and I do love taking questions. So we'll come up with a way if there are questions that I can get those answered for you guys via email or a short video. But before we do, I want to give you one. Oh gosh, there's so much here I want to cover. All right, I'm going to do this. Here's my kind of takeaway for you personally. You, you're the boss at work. If you're a leader, be the boss of your own brain. And just three things. Think about how you plug in in the morning with a morning ritual. Think about how you unplug from work at night with an evening ritual. And there's 
a million things you could do. In fact, I'll give you guys all my book. If you go to HeidiHanna.com forward slash recharge, and we'll send that out to everybody too. Um, it has my recharge book and it's full of tips of how to do this. And you're welcome to share that with your employees. There's an audit you can do on there and all sorts of stuff. Um, is just think about this, okay, morning and evening, and then how do you shift during the day? I have strategies for teams that I talk about a little bit there as well. Um, I want to show a funny video, but you know what? I'm going to, for sake of time, I'm going to skip that. It's just, you can go to YouTube and, and search for baby laughing, ripping paper. It's my favorite. I show it all the time. Um, I'm doing a humor study right now to see how humor evolves over the next couple of weeks, which has been quite a trip. Things that we found funny a couple of weeks ago aren't as funny anymore. Andy, I know you can relate to that as well. Uh, and then here's just for everybody, again, we'll send this out, um, is my email address. It does come directly to me. So feel free to send me a note or a question or comment. My website and then that, that site recharge toolkit actually has um, some guided meditations, funny videos, relaxing music. Uh, I think there's a video there about how to do an energy audit for yourself or your employees. And just trying to get all of this consolidated again with this virtual first responder movement happening now. I'm really grateful because I'm getting more support and more genius people who can kind of up up level my technology and as you can tell i mean i have like domains and websites for every passing thought that i have oh i need to give people this well i'll do this one and i need the, they have to have this so we're working on it and for those of you who do decide to connect with me on linkedin or follow me or come to the summit you're going to see a lot happening over the next few weeks um, as we really step up and, and try to help lead this virtual first responder movement, the purpose behind that, and I'll end with this, is that there's a lot of people saying a lot right now, and it can be hard to know who to trust, how much information do we need, what if I don't want it now, but I want to remember it for later. Um, it's hard to consolidate that, so I'm really making an effort to not say too much too fast, but kind of rally the troops around so that we can take really good information out there. So again, we react quickly by doing sessions like this and trying to give as much information as we can, but then we also are proactive in having a more sustainable approach to what people are really gonna need for a long time to come, not just the next couple of weeks. So there's still a few people on here. There's, there's a couple of questions I would like to ask. Sure. And then I think um, leave this slide up, leave your slide up there with your email address. Okay. So Heidi's been a friend of mine for six, seven, eight years or something like that. And um, I think she's leave, putting her email up here. So if you have a question about something or a concern, and I mentioned in the beginning that I think the next big health crisis in our world will be mental health. Yes. Before anything in your world kind of gets to that space, if you have a question about something or you need a resource, please um, utilize Heidi in that regard because she is a, a brain full of it and obviously has every domain on the planet that can do it as well. Um, can you can you repeat? Brain full. I'll get that one. Brainful.com. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have that one. Five <laughs> energy buckets. Can you just repeat the five energy buckets? Yes, good. So physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and social. Awesome. Um, favorite essential oil blends. Mm. So I'll say my own now, cause I actually have for fun been blending myself and I do all of this around the beach brain concept. So, um, in fact, you know what, I'll share these with you guys. I'll send uh, Leah and Andy. I have three recipes for the essence of the sand, the surf, and the sun. So if anyone wants to actually create blends, you can do them on your own. We just actually placed an order because we're getting so many requests, so I will have them available. At the summit is probably when we're gonna be able to start sharing those with people. Um, and I would say the main thing with that is there's different essences, really plant essences that cue the brain non-consciously towards some sort of reward. So for example, um, my favorite blend right now is the sand version. And so it's like grounding and calming and stabilizing. And one of the elements of that is Douglas fir. So any sort of woodsy smells, Douglas fir, cedar wood, and there's lots more, um, those will kind of bring us back down. And, and I kind of visualize as if our roots are kind of anchoring in the earth, anything earthy cues the brain of kind of a calm, 
level. And then um, citrus or florals can actually be a little bit more uplifting. So I use bergamot, which is one of my favorites. Um, and then there's this middle tone, and that's what I consider like my surf blends. They're the ones that kind of, I feel like they play with our nervous system a little bit, but things like Lang Lang or frankincense um, can be really nice. So I have a lot of friends who are experts in essential oils and I have always found them helpful. So I got a couple of books and just honestly bought a bunch of stuff on Amazon and started playing around with them. And now um, one of my key clients is actually Reef, who is a sandal flip-flop beach wear company here in San Diego. I've been working with him for three years on a beach brain study, looking at the benefits of being at the beach. But I've been saying all along, we need to help people take their brain there when they can't get their body there because most of the world doesn't live by the beach. So it's been fun to see this right now, really like, you know, they're, they're pushing, they were getting ready to launch a new product and they're still probably launching it, but now they're quickly pivoting and saying, we want to help people in this crisis. So we're trying to get more beach brain resources to people, which is really cool. And, and I'll say to, because we have people here in business, the best companies I work with, and again, this is probably another conversation about building really good wellness programs for your companies. The best ones I work with build it into their brand. So I'm always looking for clients who have a brand like Reef. And I'm like, wait, we could do a beach theme. Um, we have other companies in, in other locations or they kind of like Janice Henderson, I'll say is one, um, they're based in Denver. So a financial services company moved out of New York, wanted to be based in Denver to be in nature. And so they really, I've been working with them for over 10 years, but they really embrace this work-life balance. And so their culture became, if you work there, this is the type of person you are. So if you don't fit that, that's okay. But the, the type of energy those employees bring in when they know that their brand is associated with something that matters to them. And there's a, you know, um, corporate social responsibility component to that. And, you know, now people kind of put on the cloak of the brand of their organization and they walk their whole life with that on. It's just, it's, it's so powerful beyond anything I've ever seen before. So um, there's other big company, WD-40 I've worked with. I've talked with, um, that's so the loom, you know, but they can, all these companies have a unique way to say, we want to be a brand that makes people feel something. Is it joy? Is it relaxation? Is it gratitude? Make it part of your, your PR, your marketing, your sales, everything. Yeah. And WD-40 is an essential oil all in itself. <laughs> WD-40 helps you get out of sticky places or something like that, right? I was like, are you kidding me? I would love to work with that company. It's perfect. All right. So listen, um, Great to see you again. I sincerely appreciate you being here. You've helped me a lot today. I've got, I've got a ton of notes. We will, we, we recorded this. We'll have the slides, um, the recording, a recap, all in the blog. Uh, it'll get emailed to every participant. We've been getting these out by the end of the day. It may be tomorrow, depending on how backed up the team is at this point. Um, please reach out to Heidi if you have any questions. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. We have webinars continuing. Um, tomorrow is Vern Harnish's uh, summit. So look for that in your email and on the website. Friday, we have Jack Stack. Um, so we're gonna be having a fireside chat with, with Jack who's been through you know, five things in his life, kind of like what he's going through right now. So it's a pretty good perspective for people. And if we can help you with anything, Petra, please let us know, uh, you know, the people that are left on the call. And Heidi, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Hey, be well.